Hello and welcome to Where Are They Now with Mario Taniguzzi on Megapix Media, brought to you today by Spolumbos. Joining me today is Marco Iannuzzi, who is a former CFL player with the BC Lions. Thanks for joining us today, Marco. Thanks for having me. All right, Marco, let's uh, bring people and fans, football fans, up to date on uh, what you're doing these days. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess I played for um, 2011 to 17, uh, retired. Uh, while I was playing, I had a brokerage business at um, RBC. Uh, I sold that shortly after retirement from the league, uh, moved into private venture capital and been doing that for the last three years where uh, we do various uh, community outreach programs. Um, uh, also, I guess, not only community outreach, but for-profit companies, but that are centered in helping and maybe employing those people in the community. Um, everything from mental wellness to vegan protein uh, to building uh, low-income housing, you name it, anything in between. As long as it can help people and it's uh, sort of a value to our society, I'm interested in getting involved. So tell me how you got involved in that and, and doing that and the why. Well, you know, it's it's kind of just came together. I mean, during my career, I was really involved uh, in the community here in BC, and uh, a lot. Of, I guess this has become our our home. Uh, you know, when we retired, I remember everyone from Calgary asking when we're going to move back home, and and we kind of said, well, we are home now. We, we've kind of set our roots here, uh, having our kids gone to school and um, uh, sort of built our communities around us. So uh, just seeing the need in the community while I was playing, and and as I was moving into business, uh, well, I guess I was in business the whole time, but. Uh, I just realized that I wanted to make sure I had impact in everything I was doing. So just coming across the people in our circles, um, started hearing about different projects, uh, where what needed help, where I could help. Uh, and then we, we built this sort of uh, venture capital company to do that. And, and like I said, there's really no limits on what we do. If there's a project that uh, can prove value to a community and prove value to the people involved, then, then we're interested in taking part. Are you, uh, the, the focus, is it only in BC or uh, other parts of Canada? Uh, it's actually worldwide. We have some projects in Europe, um, uh, down in the States. We had one, we had one in down in uh, Cabo in Mexico. Uh, we put that on hold during COVID here, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's it, like, like I said, no bounds. Uh, it doesn't matter. Even if you were going to Mars, if, if Elon asked us to do something with Mars, maybe we'd be interested. <laughs> okay, then. Well, you mentioned Calgary and uh, being from here, uh, you went to, uh, you know, you, you played at Francis, St. Francis Browns. Um, mm -hmm. What do you remember the most about that experience of high school football, and especially with playing with such a powerhouse? Well, the brown, orange, white, I mean, I think it started much before being at Francis. It started when I was in second grade and I found my father's championship jacket in the crawl space. And, and I asked him, you know, how do I get one of these? And he said, you don't get one of these, you earn one of these. <laughs> uh, he told me all about St. Francis, you know, name on the front is the only one that matters. No nameplate on the back. And uh, from there, it just became a goal, a dream. And, and when I met up with my buds uh, in fifth and sixth and seventh grade to start playing minor football at the Calgary Cowboys, we all had a, a brother, an uncle, a dad, a cousin that had played St. Francis, and we wanted to win our jacket. So, uh, you know, when we got there, um, it was just, it was, it was pure focus. I remember I, I, I would show up to, to high school parties and I would have a, a, a Safeway bag around my hand and, and, and in my wrist, I would have, you know, um, uh, a bunch of protein snacks, liquids, because I was always recovering from our previous game and ready to get ready for the next practice. And, yeah. and I wasn't really too interested in partying because I was, I was just so focused on, on getting that jacket. And sure enough, you know, we went undefeated the first year, undefeated the second year, undefeated the third year. And um, it was really special to realize uh, that the group of guys who came together and, and wanted to achieve something, not only did we achieve one jacket, we, we achieved three and, and three peated and, and did something that never really happened or, or came before us. So we rewrote and, and raised the bar. Um, and it really made me realize when I was trying to apply to Harvard later on, when people said, oh, no, there's no way you're going to do that. It sounded a lot like when people said, oh, there's no way you guys are going to win three championships in a row undefeated. And so it was really a, a, a catapulting moment for me to realize um, the proof of anything is possible. So I, I really appreciate, and I think back at all the people that were involved, you know, the coaches, you know, the, the Joe and Sam Stambini, Tyler Park, Curtis Stapler, um, you know, all the guys that, uh, that, that showed me what it was to be a St. Francis Brown. And, and uh, I, as I think of it now, I'm just flashing all these memories and it's, uh, it was a really cool time in my life. What, uh, uh, when, when you look back at, uh, well, 
not only your era, but also the, the whole program. Why do you think that program has been successful, so successful over the years? Well, I think it comes down to the, the discipline. And, uh, you know, I remember we were told when you're wearing that helmet, you know, from you put it on in the gym and you walk down the hallway, hallway, down the steps, out the hallway, outside, you do your practice, you keep your helmet on the entire time. Uh, and you do that whole thing on the way back in. And on game day, you know, you'd wear your helmet all the way on the drive, all the way to shoulder ice. Uh, you'd play the game, even if you had media after the game and the, you know, global TV put their, their <laughs> microphone in your mouth. You know, you, you just say, hey, listen, they're like, can you take your helmet off? No, I, I can't take my helmet off because then I would become an individual. And, and so we were told to think um, about the 2000 guys that came before us and wore the helmet. So whenever it got hard, well, you think there's 2000 people that came before you that they went through it and they, they came through on the other side and they were better for it. So, so you do the same. Um, and what was interesting to me is that lesson that was carried on when I went to Harvard too. Uh, our fight song had 10,000 men of Harvard. Um, and, uh, and it was always about you're playing for not only yourself and the teammates around you, but for the, the 10,000 men that came before you. So I think St. Francis was uh, always playing for something bigger than yourself. You know, I, I must have only spoke to Gary Demand on three occasions in my life, but <laughs> I know Gary Demand and what he stands for and what he stood for. And, and uh, it's just, like I said, being part of something that is much bigger than any one person, uh, it's, it's special to know that you're part of something special and that you're contributing to that. Now, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, all the stuff you learn. Obviously, the stuff you learn in high school is specifically in that program uh, carried through right uh, uh, for you right through your career and, and into what you're doing now, right? As lessons learned then? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I, when I think of uh, running the hill, like after you had just won a game, okay, imagine this. So we had won undefeated. We we're 29 and 0. So on our 29th game, we still came back to the field. We still went up to the hill and we still ran a hill for every you know point that was scored against us and we didn't celebrate and we didn't speak to each other until we had accomplished that and and you know when you when you think of what well what does that mean it's it's because if you at the beginning of the season said this is what we're going to do because this is um what we want to get to and, and when you get to that spot instead of throwing away everything you learned you continue to do those things um that's how you keep building on success i i i hesitate when I say, um, uh, when people ask, you know, what kind of goals do I set in my life? I, I say, I'm setting goals, but at the same time, they're overlapping with other goals. And I'm never satisfied because I'm always taking what I learned from something and, and, and uh, applying it to the next thing. And I think at, at St. Francis, when you realize that for you to, you know, you take it the, the cliche, one game at a time, well, what did you learn last game? And then go to the next game. What did you learn last game? Go to the next game. Yeah. What did you learn over the last season? What did you learn over the last two seasons? And you know, the, the, uh, the hardships you go through with your friends that if you don't do your job, the guy next to you can get a concussion, he can break his leg, he can break his neck. And there's no other responsibility that a, that a, a youth could have aside from going to, to war for their country. Um, there's no other greater responsibility than playing on the football field. And I think that um, all those intangibles, those things just were embedded in me. And, and uh, I carry those today for sure in, in everything business-wise. And, and often I think back on, you know, what would my – what would my St. Francis coaches say about this or think about this? <laughs> Interesting. Well, you mentioned Harvard. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that came about and, and, and why you wanted to go to Harvard. Yeah, sure. So, so in 11th grade, uh, my father and I, we sent out 50 uh, uh, recruitment packages all across the states. I remember it was 50 because it was, it was $20 a package and we, we basically had budgeted $1,000. Um, and that was the day when you actually had to, you know, burn the DVD and send all the paper with it and everything of that sort. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I sent it out to Harvard, actually, based on uh, what Jim Barker, uh, who was the, the GM of the St. Peter's at the time, um, you know, he, he, he said, you know, you should send it to Ivy League schools, too. So when I got a piece of mail from Harvard University back saying, hey, we're interested in your senior 12th grade tape, please send it to us when you have it. I said, holy smokes, like, like Harvard actually replied to me. And it was like it was written with ink, like. I don't know who wrote this, if it was actually the head coach or not, or, you know, so it was, it was a really special moment. And, and again, like I said um, earlier, is that, is that, you know, when we were winning those championships at Francis, and it's funny because after we won the first one and the second one, people said, there's no way you're going to win a third one. It's almost like instead of celebrating us and, and saying that you guys can do anything, it was putting us down to say, oh, you're not going to do it again. And, 
And so when people, when I said, hey, I want to go to Harvard, and people started saying, oh, you're not going to go to Harvard. I said, well, you know what, maybe, maybe I just might have a chance. So, so I applied to Harvard that th in, in 12th grade. Um, and uh, uh, I get this, this letter from Harvard, and I'll never forget, it said, we regret to inform you, you have not been admitted. So I uh, went to junior, I played junior football in Edmonton for a year. We won a national championship. I upgraded my SATs. I sort of made myself more well-rounded, reapplied to Harvard. Uh, and I remember the, the, uh, the application, when you show up for uh, 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 sort of your application review, it was like 27 people around this table and they had 100 pages of your application. So the second year I came, now all these people had 200 pages of application and, and they all sort of asked me, you know, what I've been doing, this and that. And sure enough, I get home uh, two weeks later and open this piece of mail from this as we regret to inform you have not been admitted. And so at this point, uh, you know, most people in my life, to some extent, were telling me to move on. And I had great offers. You know, I had the Notre Dame, the Boise States, the Purdue's, all those offers from big football schools. But I had had the taste of Harvard, you know, and, and, and to think of what Harvard was, you know, you're one ACL tear away from never playing football again. And, um, you know, I remember my mom told me when I was growing up and when she had uh, developed her MS, she, she told me that, you know, sometimes your body doesn't allow you to do the things you wanted to do. So make sure you train your mind just as well. And so uh, Harvard was on my mind. And, and uh, on the third time, I actually went to Ohio. Uh, I went to a prep school there. I competed in all sorts of sports. Um, I took advanced courses that I knew I wasn't going to do well in because I, I wasn't caring about building a resume at that point. I was just caring about building a better person in myself and applied the third time to Harvard and showed up. And now these guys and gals had 300 pages of application and, and they pretty much looked at me and said, Hey, listen, if we just let you in, will you please stop sending us applications? <laughs> what did you take there? I started out taking economics uh, pre-med. I always wanted to be a doctor on the research side to uh, hopefully cure MS to, you know, help uh, people like my mother. Um, halfway through uh, my my Harvard um, degree, uh, I launched a financial business based on the economic economic side of my degree, um, and I realized I didn't need the economics anymore because I could launch a, a financial business uh, with without completing this degree, and and it became more theoretical at that point. Uh, because I had all the pre med behind me, uh, I started thinking about okay, maybe I should uh, really actively pursue this medical path. Uh, then I realized, I started with the finance company, I realized, well, if I could raise X amount of dollars, I could actually place 10 people like me in a research lab, and they would probably do a lot better in that research lab than, than certainly one of me. But when I started realizing some of the amazing minds of, of research around me at Harvard, um, I knew that uh, I, I was outmatched. So it would probably be in my best interest to fund people who were smarter than me to do more than I could do. Um, so I flipped my degree into architecture and environmental science at that point. I cross-registered at MIT and took my architectural courses there. Uh, I really wanted to leave a lot of my doors open. Um, and, and sure enough, uh, I've used all those degrees to some extent. I, I had an architectural business for a year. I felt that one out, uh, moved on from there. Like I said, I did the financial business 1.0. And then while I was playing pro, I did my financial business 2.0. Um, the architecture side of things, I've, I've been a part of many developments from uh, private islands, building golf courses, uh, to, to low-income housing, to mental, health, mental wellness facilities. Um, so uh, really having a wide breadth um, is what I focused on and, and really utilizing that wide breadth now is what I'm doing right now. Okay, super. Well, you mentioned your pro career, obviously, you played for the BC Lions. What was the highlight uh, of playing for the Lions? Every moment of, of all seven years. I mean, walking out on the field and uh, uh, realizing that I was playing professional football, which was my childhood dream. I mean, if I had to boil it down to one moment, um, I would say it was the moment of two hours before every game started where I'd walk out on the field and there would be minor football teams or, or uh, you know, just any of our season ticket holders, they got to gather on the sidelines to kind of get the backstage pass. And, and I would go and I'd give a high five uh, shake hands with with every single one of the kids there because I remember when I was a kid hanging over the edge of uh, McMahon Stadium right where you know the players go in underneath the side there and and I would hang so far that I'd, I'd nearly break my ribs just trying to get one high five um, you know and I remember Freddie Childress giving me a high five I remember obviously Larry Deck that was an awesome time when, when Larry Deck was uh, visiting he was playing for Sask at the time um, just just being able to uh, to touch greatness, you know, to, to give a high five to a pro. So as a pro myself, 
um, I tried to honestly, I, I must have given, you know, over 10,000 high fives pregame. And, and uh, when I think back on the impact that those little high fives had on my life, um, and hopefully of those 10,000 people, maybe I impacted one of them, um, you know, that, that's the coolest feeling is just knowing you're having an impact. Okay. And you played for, uh, for Wally, right? Yeah. I, I, uh, so Wally and I were, so Wally was head coach and GM uh, my entire time there. Uh, well, there's sometimes when he was down from head coach, but then I was a player and I was actually representing myself as agent. So uh, we would go into the boardroom together every couple of years to renegotiate or, or resign and, and we'd butt heads. Um, and then we'd come out from there and then we'd be pals on the field and we'd be coach and player. And, uh, um, you know, I had a lot of respect for Wally and what he accomplished. And uh, I think, you know, there's so many levels to my relationship with them as far as, uh, you know, we were coach and player, we were agent and GM, um, we were, we were uh, business, business uh, partners, we were father, son, we were cousins, you know, it was almost everything all in the family. So uh, a lot of good memories there with Wally. Okay. And of course, we're talking about Wally Buono, who uh, uh, is well known to people here in Calgary, as well as, uh, you know, uh, formerly tied with the Calgary Stampeders. Now, before we leave, uh, Marco, I, I have to ask you a question. As I'm looking up uh, your bio earlier today, I noticed the one thing that was kind of not odd, but a little different, and it was uh, winning an episode of Canada's Smartest Person, uh, a CBC TV reality uh, series. I must confess, I don't, re I don't recall this, uh, <laughs> this television series, but can you tell us a little bit about that and what that was all about? Yeah, it was a neat little show. I mean, CBC came to me and uh, they, they, you know, identified me as a person who could be Canada's smartest person. So I said, well, you guys, somehow someone fooled you into thinking that, but I'll go along with it. Uh, so I went out to Toronto. We filmed the show. It was uh, filmed over two days. Um, and uh, it was neat. I mean, you check out the episode. It was, it was really a, a tapping into all aspects of your, your um mental capacity and physical capacity, uh, but not only just like how good are you at math, but what are your, you know, uh, abilities to identify other people's emotions? What are your musical talents? And, and so all of these things came together and it was, uh, it was really neat because like I said, in my Harvard degree and, and everything I've done, I really try to, to uh, create a wide breadth of knowledge and, and that's where I draw my decisions from. And, and so that game was almost tailored to me. So I, uh, if you check out the episode, it was lots of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, actually we just put it on a, a few months back well, during the uh, lockdown here and uh, our kids got to watch it again and they don't remember, you know, because they were younger. And so they haven't seen it again. They were like, well, so wait a second, are you actually Canada's smartest person? I said, well, it's the title of the show. I don't know if many people would consider me Canada's smartest person, but uh, it was a lot of fun and, um, and it was a, it, it's an honor to have that title, I guess. <laughs> okay, and I think it was November, 2015, right? Yeah, yeah, you can look at, I think uh, it's tagged on my LinkedIn page, the uh, the episode, I can't remember what episode, something six, season two, something like that, anyways, but uh, but it's online, and it's uh, it's it's archivable, so. Okay, one <laughs> last question, uh, Marco, uh, 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 you still have, uh, I presume you still have a lot of connections here in Calgary, uh, what do you miss the most about uh, not being here? You know, I, uh, there's lots, I mean, when you say that, I start thinking of all my high school buds, right? I obviously think my family's all there. And, and so we, we tried to, you know, during my career, we'd always fly my parents out here to watch games and get everyone to visit here because obviously BC was come over here in the summertime type thing, right? Um, but, uh, you know, there's just, it's just where I'm from. And, and uh, I remember Joe Stambini told me and he gave me, uh, you know, a number of things in my career. Uh, to remember, but he, he told me one thing and uh, he said, never forget where you came from, right? And then he always referenced Walter Payton and, and his book, Never Die Easy, and never forget where you came from. And so when you say, what do I miss most? I miss it all, man. It's, it's, uh, it's a part of my life that um, because it came to an end, because we're no longer living there, uh, the further you get from it, it just becomes more and more special that time. And you think of uh, all the things that I learned, uh, the people I met, the connections I made and where I went from there. And, and uh, it all came from, you know, those fir first 18 years of my life. And uh, we haven't lived away from Calgary for 18 years yet, but uh, I'll tell you, I, I certainly do miss it. And there's still a ton of love there. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, 
we're, we've moved away, but uh, you know, we'll always be back a little bit each year. Okay, super. Well, thanks so much, uh, Marco, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks to Spalamos for, for putting this together too. Yeah, it's, uh, it's when you say, well, one last memory is the coolest thing is uh, I always would go into Spalamos and look up on that wall and see everyone's jerseys. And I remember telling myself one day, is, you know, I really want to earn myself a spot up there and get my jersey up there. And, and uh, our equipment guy, Cato, uh, rest in peace, who passed away a few years ago, uh, once I'd been established in the league for a few years, because he said, no, no, you can't send Tony – you can't send him a jersey until you're actually like, you know, like a really good player, man. Like you can't do that. <laughs> and so anyways, we showed up to Calgary, uh, whatever week it was in uh, my second or third season. And, and sure enough, uh, you know, it was up on the wall and it was a great moment for me to, to look back and, and, you know, see that I made it there. So uh, thanks again to, to Spally and the boys. <laughs> okay, super. That was Marco Iannuzzi, who was a former CFL player with the BC Lions. Uh, joining us today on Where Are They Now? Uh, with Mario Tanaguzzi on Megapix Media, brought to you today by Spolumbos. Thanks for joining us.